Let's play, let's see how many different rooms I can film in this year. Hello, this is Emma from Beanbag Books and I'm in yet another bedroom. I think this is maybe the third room I've filmed in so far this year. I'm just trying a few things out. And before we get too far into March, I wanted to at least try to film a February book wrap up. I read six books this February, which for me, during the school year or during a work year would be a good amount, but since I haven't been working that actually isn't a whole lot. So hopefully this will be a short video. I did a whole lot of digital reading this month. I did a lot of audiobooks and ebooks, so I don't have anything to hold up. I'm gonna have to edit in everything when I'm done. But the first book that I read was Someone Who May Shock and Discredit You by Daniel M. Lavery. So my hype level for this book was like through the roof because Daniel M. Lavery has been one of my favorite writers ever since his days as one of the editors of The Toast. If you don't know what The Toast is and that number of people is growing sadly larger and larger by the day, it used to be a website that wrote about women, society, and literature, and it had this oddball sense of humor, kind of similar to my own when I was a late teen and discovered the site, and was a comfort to me because I still kind of felt like nobody understood me, even though I probably should have grown out of that at about age 16. I remember the summer of a toast ended for good. I actually was going through my first breakup at that time, and the toast ending felt like a second breakup, like that's how sad I was about it. And I've, I've tried to read everything that Lavery has written since then. I have been pretty successful. Didn't get to this for a couple of years, but finally did. And to be honest, I really wish I enjoyed it more. I'm giving it three stars, which isn't a bad rating for me, but I think I just expected more because this was Daniel M. Lavery. He talks here mostly about his experiences as a trans man who realized that he was trans in his early 30s. His typical brand of humor, which is very neurotic and self-aware and nerdy, it's on full display here. It works, it's super enjoyable. One of my favorite pieces from this collection is an essay on the different kinds of vibes that men could give off. and. Lavery talks about how before he transitioned, he would just kind of yell to men in the street that he really appreciated their vibes. And I think it really beautifully shows both his desire to be accepted as a young man himself, and also depicts a positive side to masculinity that shows why someone might want to be a man so badly and feel connected to that group of people. The whole I hate men feminist vibe is often very hurtful to a lot of trans men. I really like seeing this perspective on the positive side of what masculinity can be. Though I do appreciate in general Avery's perspective on this issue that he's experienced, my main problem was just the wordiness of it all. It's kind of prolixity, I guess, is part of his brand of humor, but I think that he should have been edited off the ledge just a little bit more. He also sprinkles in the kinds of literary parodies that he was well known for at The Toast, which I found to be a little bit tired, but maybe that's because I am so familiar with his earlier work that I've already read like everything that he's done. Perhaps just someone who is a little bit less familiar with him, those, uh, those literary parodies would come off as more fresh and funny. I did, however, love one of them, and that was uh, a piece imagining the reactions that the Avonlea women would have to Anne of Green Gables coming out as a trans man. It was so funny, he captured the voices of all of the women in the town so beautifully. I would recommend this collection for those who are interested in his perspective as a late in life trans man, and also people who really like lots of literary references. The next book I read was a novel. I was feeling a little bit nostalgic, uh, wanted something that was kind of a sweet romance because it was around Valentine's Day, and I picked up Summers at Castle Auburn by Sharon Shin. Sharon Shin is an author I read a lot of when I was a teenager. Uh, she wrote a lot of YA fantasy. She's a little older of an author in terms of when she was published. She was more like 90s, 2000s, so I think not a lot of people knew about her, but I found one of her books at the library one day and then got hooked. I cannot tell you how beautifully that this book hit the spot, seriously. It just, just when I was, you know, longing for simpler times, along here comes this book. The protagonist of, the, of this book is Cory, who is a young girl who's a bastard daughter of a wealthy nobleman. She spends every summer at Castle Auburn with her slightly older half-sister Alessandra, who is engaged to the very swoony Prince Brian. So one weird thing about Sharon Shin is that her female characters in her books, they're always, you know, they're always set in fantastical worlds, and her female characters have these beautiful fantasy-sounding names like Coriel and Alessandra and Elida, and her men have these, like, very typical white boy names like Brian and Gregory and Alexander. <laughs> 
It takes you a little bit out of the story, but okay, Sharon Jen. Overall, it's a coming of age about Corey's relationship to her family, to power, and to herself. The first third of this book is set when Corey's quite young. I think she's only maybe 13 or 14, so she comes off kind of annoying in that section, but she definitely becomes more likable as she grows up, as most of us do, I hope. Sharon Shin depicts relationships between siblings really beautifully, as always, as well as friendships. And she also doesn't shy away from more serious topics, which is nice. One example of this are these human-like fey creatures called the Aeliora, who are forced to serve the nobility and are shackled in copper so that their powers are suppressed. Cory is always kind of an Aeliora that are enslaved in the castle, but she isn't let off the hook for participating in this system that oppresses them either. Their enslavement becomes a major threat, especially in the later part of the book, and it does not shy away from a lot of sobering aspects of that oppression. There are one or two brief scenes of violence in here. I do wish that the romances in this book were a little bit better foreshadowed. I felt like Sharon Shim was kind of trying to trick us into, oh, you thought this person was going to be with this person? Oh no, they're actually with this other person who seemed like they were in love with this person. And I... I don't know, I kind of felt that she would have been better off making it a little bit more obvious rather than trying to hide it because it just confused me. It was nice, but, but it confused me. Overall, I would give this book four stars. I especially loved its really gorgeous poetic writing. That's something that's kind of a rarity in YA these days. I'm going to read a sentence for you and if you think it's way too purple, then don't read the book. But if you really like it, I think you would enjoy the book. The Season Advanced. The sun grew small and ungenerous, parceling out a few watery hours of light every day. The nights turned long, bleak, and frigid. Companionship and firelight were the only weapons we had with which to combat desolation." Next up is a book that has been very, very strongly featured in a lot of like best of lists and uh, prize list. It was long listed for the Women's Prize. That is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. I listened to the audiobook. It was read by Renata Friedman. I thought she did a very nice job with this reading, especially since there are a lot of very long sentences with lots of clauses that it's very easy to get lost in. I thought she navigated that super well. Tori Peters said in an interview about this book that she wrote Detransition Baby with trans women in mind and anybody else could catch up if they wanted to. The premise, if you haven't heard of it, which you probably have, is that Ames, uh, now identifying as a man but who previously identified as a trans woman named Amy, has gotten his boss pregnant and enlists his trans ex-girlfriend Reese to help raise the child because she's always wanted to raise a child. This book deals with a lot of very thorny, unlikable characters doing sometimes unpleasant things. Ames, who's, who's referred to as Ames in the present and referred to as Amy ta when talking about the, his past as a trans woman, tries to reconcile his former identity with his current one and that causes a lot of mishaps and misunderstandings along the way. We also often see his ex Reese acting in various obsessive kind of self-destructive ways as she struggles to be seen as a woman despite how she appears to some. And the book actually spends about half of its time in flashbacks to Amy and Reese's past, uh, go really going into their reasons for acting as they do, and, and then the other half is set in the present with the situation regarding the baby. This did occasionally slow the pace of the book down. I sometimes would be interrupted in a sequence that I was interested in to be flown back into the past, but Ultimately, the character development is essential to the story. The transition baby is often a struggle to read, and that's not just because the characters are so damaged, that is part of it. Another part of it is that the storyline is often derailed not just by the flashbacks, but by different characters' musings on the nature of gender in society or other such things. These tangents are usually interesting to read just because Tori Peters is a really skilled writer and she's very good at capturing those nitty-gritty aspects of how people think, but they do seem like more of an attempt to just discuss social issues in any way possible rather than something that truly furthers the story. Think about the way that Victor Hugo just starts talking about sewers and Les Miserables, and it's less jarring than that, and it's less extreme than that, but there is a little bit of that Let's get the social issues in here so people will eat their vegetables and then go on to the rest of the story. The writing is often very quippy and ironic and that works super well. Here's an example. So anyway, speaking of trans, Reese decides to say to Katrina, 
Does your work send you to lots of queer events like this, or is this your first time being out with one and a half trans women? And then occasionally it'll get a little bit didactic, like here's an example of that. All my white girlfriends just automatically assume that reproductive rights are about the right to not have children, as if the right and naturalness of motherhood is presumptive. But for lots of other women in this country, the opposite is true. Think about Black women, poor women, immigrant women. Think about forced sterilization, about the term welfare queens or anchor babies. All of that happened to enforce the idea that not all motherhoods are legitimate. I don't have an issue with the statement itself appearing in the text, but this is set up as a real thing that someone actually says in conversation, and it feels a little bit too crafted, I'll say, for that to be the case. A little too MFA workshopped to come up in natural conversation, if you will. And this happens over and over again throughout the book. But even though this does slow the story down quite a bit, I was never not engaged. Tori Peters said that she wanted to write a book where trans people don't have to prove their worth through moral perfection, where they could just be flawed and difficult like any other kind of person. And I think in that she succeeded. I would give this overall three and a half stars because like I said, I did have some issues with it. But as I said, it was consistently interesting and engaging for me as a reader. Next up is a book that's getting the exact same rating, and that is The Witches Are Coming by Lindy West. As you'll know if you saw last week's Best Books of 2020, 20, what? As you'll know if you saw last week's Best Books of 2021 video, I know it came out late, I'm sorry, but at least it came out, right? One of my favorite books of last year was Lindy West's memoir, Shrill. I gave that five stars. I'm always happy for more of Lindy West's thoughts and opinions, but this collection just kind of didn't grab me in the same way that Shrill did. And I think that's because Shrill is so rooted in West's own personal experiences, which are informed by the topics that she's talking about. Whereas I think The Witches Are Coming is her just sort of meditating on various pop culture and political topics, and I already agreed with her on pretty much everything she was saying. I was just kind of nodding my head the whole time. There were some really good essays in here about topics I was a little bit less familiar with. Uh, one, one that I really liked was about Joan Rivers's complicated legacy as an early female comedian who of course was a trailblazer but also consistently put down other women. I also liked an essay about the quote-unquote feminazi activists of 90s fictional media, which is something that I have been thinking about recently after watching You've Got Mail and thinking, okay, why are we making fun of um, Kathleen Kelly's boyfriend for caring about politics? Like, why is this funny again? I listened to West herself reading this on audiobook, and it was a very nice way to pass my time when I was in bed sick, but it wasn't wasn't quite at the level of shrill for me. Okay. I'm gonna try to get this over with fast. I can't promise to not get angry, because I'm pretty sure this is the first one star I've given on my channel, and there are gonna be people who are not gonna be happy with me about it. My first one star on my channel is... This is How You Lose the Time War by Amala Motar and Max Gladstone. I know. I expected for this book to maybe not live up to the hype. I expected to perhaps give it a three or three and a half, but I did not expect this level of hatred for this story. This book was pointless. It was absolutely pointless. It is basically just some, some, some sort of thought experiment and I derived absolutely nothing from it. As far as I can tell, This Is How You Lose a Time War is supposed to be a love story about warring time-traveling secret agents. That's how it was pitched to me in many different reviews and many different videos. But to me, saying that this is a love story is kind of like saying that Narcissus falling for his own reflection is a love story because Red and Blue are so similar that I could not separate one from the other for the life of me. Their letters are written almost identically, even though the text seems to be trying to tell us that blue is the refined and sophisticated one and red is the rough and tough one. But they write exactly the same, Howard. <sighs> but they write exactly the same in this very flowery, ornate prose that if you've never heard the term gilding the lily, this book is all you need to know about that term, believe me. It's like every single sentence has to have some sort of stylistic decoration, and it results in these metaphors and flourishes that are so thick and confusing that uh, it's trying so hard to avoid cliche that it actually becomes a cliche. How do you do that? How do you do it? And you'd think, this book has two authors, you'd think that in a book with two authors that this would not happen, but 
I flipped to the acknowledgments after finishing the book and the two writers write different acknowledgments and they write the acknowledgments in the exact same way. They write completely identically there too. This is a little bit personal for me, I guess, because the one of my least favorite things in all of literature is a love story that tries to tell you that the love between the main characters is pure and true and strong and can overcome everything and is not sufficiently able to show you that. This is what brought The Matrix from a four-star movie to a three-star movie for me because it did this too. But The Matrix had a lot of cool world-building stuff going for it. This book's got nothing. Absolutely nothing. The whole essence of the story is writing on this supposed love story that they cannot even prove. This book doesn't care about the plot. The sci-fi setting is just this all these rapid fire time traveling scenarios that don't actually mean anything. The whole point of this book is that these two people are supposed to be in love and they can't prove that to me. Being told love exists isn't enough. I need to see it. This book couldn't show it to me. And since that was clearly the entire point of the book and it did not care about anything else, I got nothing from it as a result, except knowing that this book isn't worth the hype. I don't mean to dunk on anybody who loves this book. If you loved this book and you did get something out of it, then I am truly and genuinely happy that the paper this book is printed on is at least worth something because I just didn't get it, okay? I'm sorry, one star, I won't lie. I kind of wish I had the time I spent reading this book back uh, and when that happens I know a book is a one star. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay, um, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Um, I'm going to just talk about one more book and then we'll be done and this one I actually liked quite a bit better. I think I gave it like a three and a half. Uh, this was Kappa Imperial, The Greatest Empire That ne Never Was by Angelica Garodischer, and it was translated from Spanish by Ursula K. Le Guin. As a translator, I'm always looking for cool books written in the languages that I speak, even if I can only obtain them in translation. And this was no exception. I was really excited by the concept of Kappa Imperial. Think of it as kind of a fictional biography of a country. The author takes us on a tour of The Greatest Empire never. She shows us the empress who isn't that pretty but worked her way up from dirt and squalor to win the hearts of thousands. She tells us about the doctor who doesn't ever cure what you think you have but is very good at figuring out what you actually do have. And she also introduces us to a boy who brought dancing to the empire, the capital city that was abandoned later brought back to, and later brought back to life, and all the storytellers who, who make this tale possible. If it hadn't been for the last few stories in this collection, I would actually be prepared to give this book like a high four or four and a half. Uh, I was so swept away by the quality of the writing and the translation because Ursula K. Le Guin's English translation is really marvelous. It's like inhaling really classy perfume. But the last few stories I felt just kind of lost steam, they meandered a lot, I found them to be a bit more predictable than the others, so that's why this rating is a little bit lower. Uh, but overall this was a really lovely read. The closest thing I can compare it to is Catherine M. Valenti's Orphan's Tales, if you've ever read those. They're also tragically underread, unfortunately. Most things by Valenti will actually kind of give you this vibe, so if, you, if you've ever read anything by her, then you probably understand, like, the kind of story we're working with here. I also saw a hint of the never-ending story, the book, obviously, in here, but I also tend to see that book in pretty much everything, so maybe that's just my perspective. But either way, I really enjoyed reading this collection, and I would recommend it to anybody who's looking for a really kind of rich high fantasy that is a bit fairy tale esque If you liked The Language of Thorns better than Lee Bardugo's actual novels, I think you would like this book. I, I think we're done here. Wow, I'm, I'm so worked up from that Time War review that I'm kind of tired. So I'll hopefully get this up before, uh, I guess, April? And uh, I also have a project that I've been working on that I'm excited to talk to you all about, and uh, I hope to get that out pretty soon too. Thank you as always for watching or at least playing this in the background. Bye!